Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in mobile healthcare, which leverages technology to reach patients all over the world and at lower costs, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is the CEO and founder of Click Medics, an award-winning mHealth connected platform designed to facilitate telehealth disease management and health education services through mobile technologies. But before I introduce you to Ting Shi, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays with unique insights into dozens of different industries from the professionals who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my healthcare lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Ting Shi, co-founder and CEO of Click Medics, an award-winning mHealth enterprise that Ting conceived of while she was a student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT. ClickMedics' mission has been to enable health organizations to serve more patients from Uganda to the United States, from Chile to China, and from Ghana to Guatemala at lower costs. Ting has implemented mobile health programs across 20 countries in North America, South America, Africa, and Asia, serving more than 400,000 patients to address chronic diseases and infectious diseases via ClickMedics' mHealth Connected platform. Prior to ClickMedics, Ting worked for a decade designing and launching technology services for the U.S. Department of Defense, a global pharmaceutical company, an education startup, and at a management consulting firm. Her areas of expertise include technology solution design, business model development, scaling strategy, lean Six Sigma process improvement, operations management, and organization change management. Ting, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Ha, absolutely. I just drank this bang peach mango, but my usual is Mallorca coffee. Ooh, Mallorca coffee. Do you get <laughs> it when you're in Spain? You know, funny thing is the manufacturing company literally is five minutes away from where I'm living now in Rockville, Maryland. Really? Well, since I also live in Maryland, what company is that? Majorca, uh, Majorca, Majorca, M A Y O R G A. Oh. oh, wow. Oh my gosh. You're opening my eyes to new things <laughs> in my neighborhood. So thank you so much. <laughs> I am so excited to have you on, Ting, because as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I spent six years working at Mercy Corps, which is a global humanitarian and development organization. And I got to see social enterprises up close and personal through the amazing work that our local partners were engaged in in 40 countries around the world. And I thought maybe before we dig into how to break into healthcare technology, it would be maybe useful for our young listeners to better understand what a social enterprise is. Sure. Social enterprise only has many definitions, but the commonality is certainly impact-driven, 
and run by very passionate people that are out there to solve one of the world's biggest challenges. Our goal as a social enterprise is to improve the health of over a billion people, and we will stop at nothing until we get there. And that's characteristic of social enterprises that I've encountered over the world. They're solving issues like how do we provide clean water in villages that literally are run by farmers or cows, and or energy grids, or how do you provide electricity? So if you look at one of the toughest challenges that just takes someone so persistent, passionate, that's how I would define a social enterprise. But certainly. It also looks at ways to scale by empowering those in the communities and help them become business owners. That's also another characteristic that's special to social enterprises: do well, do good, and help train other people to do well for themselves. And that's how we can multiply and scale the impact. Fantastic! And we should also underscore the fact that when you say "do well" while you're doing good, you mean You can make money doing this. This is <laughs> yes. not a nonprofit. This is not about just helping people, and it's not a revenue generator. But in fact, social enterprises can make a lot of money too. Yeah, yeah. Social enterprises can make as much money as other enterprises. There's nothing that says you're a social enterprise, therefore you can't make money. And and that's, <laughs> I mean, just because we're working globally, working with those that are that have less resources, doesn't mean there's no funding. If you look at a lot of impact work, I mean, billions of dollars for aid agencies, USAID, UK Aid, a number of those. Billions of dollars are being dispensed towards nonprofits, social enterprises, and those that want to create impact. There is a lot of money for this type of work, and I think what's really important is the scaling aspect. How do you create impact that's not at a profit loss? You don't lose money doing it, and how do you do that multiple times over and over? Yes, and that's how you can be profitable and have. Huge impact on the world. Absolutely, and it isn't just the aid organizations, of course, that are helping get these social enterprises off the ground. Once they do get running, you may be charging a small amount of money, relatively speaking, for the service. But when you scale it, because you're reaching. So many people. That's where the revenue comes, and ideally, you want this to be self-fulfilling or self-sufficient, multiplying on their exactly, own. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's dive into our ten espresso shots, which we are framing around healthcare technology. What entry-level jobs today are available to young people who want to break into healthcare technology? That's a great question. If you look at health technology, is healthcare. And technologies, so certainly programmers, user interface designers, project managers, or product managers are all considered job descriptions that entry level those graduating out of schools can enter. If you look at the healthcare part of it, there's a lot of understanding of how services are delivered. We call it workflows, which would be. A nurse sees a patient, then the nurse transmits the data to a doctor. The doctor then returns with descriptions or health advice. So that would be workflow that doesn't require any technology expertise. What we look for in terms of people who are great in this field, one is empathy, understanding the patient perspective, really understanding how can we create solutions to help that patient who may be a senior at home that literally can't go see a. Doctor, especially in this pandemic situation, and many, many patients just like them. How do we solve for that? So there's no limit as to the entry level jobs that are available. I think it comes down to people seeking out the impact they want to have early in their career. Yeah, and in terms of like job titles for those、mm-hmm. entry level positions, what are the most common titles that? Our young listeners should be looking out for on company websites or job boards for those entry level positions. Particularly in healthcare technology, there are a number of technology jobs that are applicable. So, software analysts, testers, business process engineer, business analysts, entry level project manager. 
So those would be what I would think are entry-level titles to look up for. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You mentioned empathy, which is one of my Mm -hmm. all-time favorite soft skills. What, in your opinion, Ting, are useful, hard, and soft skills that you look for in the young people that you hire? Mm, Yeah, so certainly empathy, just to kind of unfold that a little, is really being able to step in the shoes of that patient or even that nurse that needs to use the technology in order to get the care that they need and understanding nuances such as, well, a senior person may not have the greatest vision. They're not going to be able to read what's on an iPhone. So then you may want more of a tablet set up so that it's larger font. If we look at um, nurses, it could be that they, in in some of the early work we did in sub-Saharan Africa, nurses have never seen a smartphone in their life. It was the first time they've ever seen it when we brought it to them and started training them on, on the system. You know, understanding that perspective. And also, I think another part is just people's ability to adapt. When we did the initial training, it took them like 10 seconds <laughs> to actually know how to use a smartphone. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's also another level of soft skill, you know, not underestimating people and not have, assumptions about what people can or cannot do. You never know until you try. So I think, you know, that attitude of giving people the benefit of the doubt and really being unbiased in terms of developing a product or solution and really just observe what people are seeing, doing, and understanding what their needs are. So that's another really important skill that's really quite hard to explain and train people on. I find some people are naturals at it and some people <laughs> need a lot of work and <laughs> just not, not natural or intuitive. And so definitely skills that where if you are conscious about needing that skill, then you can acquire it. So that, that's the interesting thing about soft skills. Now, on hard skills, uh, something really easy to do and learn, it's really process mapping or user story mapping. Tons of materials on how to do that. And very, very helpful to have that skill, especially when, for example, our health technology is a platform, which means you can set it up to whichever disease. So what's important is how will a user, say, manage diabetes? What is their process? Who else needs to be involved? Is there a doctor, a nurse, a patient? And is there a family caregiver that's involved? And then be able to map it out into a story map or process map. There are a number of other technical terms for it. A discipline would be process engineering. So my master's is in systems engineering, which does exactly those type of skills. Mm -hmm. Other certainly programming skills helpful, website design, user interface design skills are helpful. Another skill that's kind of a hard and soft, it's facilitation skills, just communications. How do you communicate, let's say in a training aspect to help people understand how to resolve the issues they're having? Our most common problem is how do I log in? You know, how do you communicate? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or I forgot my password. (laughs) You know, hey, I deal with that all the time. <laughs> things, things like that. So how do you communicate that and then be able to more automatically respond to those common requests? So those are kind of a combination of soft and hard skills that we look for. And none of this is hard to learn. I think it does start with understanding the user perspective, putting yourself in their shoes, and then everything else can be learned and goes from there. Terrific. So. You mentioned your grad school experience. I want to ask you for our college students right now, and maybe those who've graduated recently, is someone's college major a deciding factor to get into this profession? In other words, Ting, if they haven't studied, as you did, computer science as an undergrad, or if they haven't studied process mapping, website design, Whatever it is, is it a deal breaker? Absolutely not. I think it's serendipitous I started in computer science and all the other disciplines I chose to study and get degrees in all happen to be important to what I do. Yeah, I didn't start out with what I wanted to do in the first place and figure out what majors I should be in. Kind of all fell in place and it felt like it was fulfilled 
and purposeful towards what I'm doing right now. You can be in any major to get into healthcare technologies. There are many with arts degrees even in healthcare technology. And what's so fascinating about the field in healthcare is everyone needs it. Everyone can understand it and the difficulties in it. There's no major that dictates you must take that in order to get into healthcare technologies. However, it is helpful to have some um, tech savviness. You should like technology in the first place. And there's no limit in terms of resources available online, especially now with everything uh, to online studies and also YouTube videos as to what you can do and learn the skills that you may not have. And also there's learning on the job. So I'd say, you know, common majors, though, are science majors, technology majors, engineering majors for healthcare technology. But really, you can be any major to get into the field. I think what's helpful in hindsight is to have a career goal in mind and then figure out, okay, if I if I take a pro- programming course, that won't hurt me at all. It will probably help me in whatever else I do later on. Uh, if I take a communications course, that will help whatever I do later on. So I'd say in hindsight, you know, having an area of focus for career is probably helpful. Yeah. in terms of deciding what skills you need to acquire by the various education disciplines. So I'd like to dig into that just a little bit more. You mentioned that there are even arts majors. I'm guessing that you're kind of putting it in the category of liberal arts majors mm-hmm. who have gotten into this field and, and the design arts. Design arts like graphics. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So if someone has a liberal arts degree and did not take any coding and didn't do that. You mentioned YouTube videos, but what do you think a good entry point would be for them to get into healthcare technology? If they're interested in this field, could they get into it from the marketing standpoint or communication standpoint or the design standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. All of the above. And I'd say, you know, a lot of engineers may have less experience in the communications piece. And when you look at social enterprises or business in general, the communications is key across any business. And having a liberal arts degree certainly help with that aspect. And there's so much communication externally as well as internally. So we certainly have a lot of liberal arts majors in our team, and they certainly are very much assets in terms of product design, product development, product communications. So a number of things and skills that they can apply. Excellent. Okay. Now for grad school degrees, and I know you've got a whole bunch of them. (laughs) What do you think are the most useful grad school degrees to get? Less so for the entry level positions, more so for people who want to kind of level up their skills? And if so, what do you think are the most useful ones to have, Tim? I am certainly an advocate of getting an MBA. It literally was life-changing for me. I would not have found it ClickMedics if I didn't go to business school. So I think it's and, and one of the reasons why I went to business school was to have that career change. I was working at a pharmaceutical company. I love their mission, improving lives and help people become healthier. But I wasn't doing that in a data center. <laughs> I was <laughs> directly, but it's so far, so many steps away from doing that, that I wanted a career change. And I, you know, I know going to business school is a way to do that pretty quickly. And, 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 and I'm pr- living proof of that being true. I mean, even in the first year of my MBA, I was working on ClickMedics concepts and looking for other people and like minds and professors who can help me make this true. So I certainly think grad degrees in whichever field is, and if you have a direction for whichever field you want to go into, it's definitely helpful in terms of growing an idea and a career path that may be different than your current work or, you know, what you studied in undergrad. So I think it's helpful to have a grad degree. Equivalence of that would certainly be work experiences. And I do think a combination of both is the best. Work experiences help you understand what you like and what you don't like in a career. Yeah. And then grad degree help you kind of level up to where you want to be in the next five, 10 years. And I can tell you in my application essay, you know, I, I wrote about 
where I want to be in five, 10 years. I got there in two years. Wow. Because, <laughs> well, when you have your own business, right? You make yourself the CEO and founder, right? Hey, <laughs> that's what so I did. I <laughs> to get there. Exactly. <laughs> and it's just so empowering. It's, you know, I, I say, I mean, grad degree on top of just a degree, I think it's really the experience and how it changes you, your ideals, what you think your purpose is in life, and then literally get to it. So I think that one of my personal experiences and the benefit of getting grad degrees. And I have three masters. Each of them brought different aspects. Um, I'd say the MBA is what brought it all together. Could you just mention the other two for our audience? Yeah, sure, sure. I have a, a master's in science and information technology from Carnegie Mellon. And at MIT, I joined a dual degree program, MBA and a master's of science of your choice. And I chose master's of science in systems engineering. Great. Thank you so much. That was an amazing answer. <laughs> what kind of life experiences, Ting, do you think are most useful for someone who's starting out in this field? And by life experiences, I'm really referring to things outside the classroom. It could just be living or growing up in another culture. It could be growing up with someone who was sick or struggling with some kind of illness, especially since we're talking about healthcare technology, what do you think are the most useful life experiences that someone could either try to cultivate or do you think might also naturally have had? So growing up, I did live with my parent, uh, my grandparents in Taiwan, and certainly they have a number of chronic ailments. So I felt like that was the norm, you know, going to hospitals, visiting them, and then seeing them at home, resting, all of that. And then I think what really, really got me into the field is the field work we did in Sub-Saharan Africa in places where there's just such a lack of access to healthcare. There was one doctor and then people waited outside the clinic for like a whole day. And if they didn't get to see the doctor, then they have to pay for their you know overnight stay and then wait again. And they continue to do this until they see the doctor while they're sick. And obviously, there's no sitting room. They're standing in my like really hot sun, feeding the insects and all of that. It's a horrible, horrible experience. And to know that, you know, we have a solution that could help people in those situations, it's just, I would say, life changing. And, you know, we said about passion earlier as a social enterprise, you really got to have that passion because of so much hardship. You're going to get to fundraising, building a product, all of that, all of that. That's where the passion comes at. It needs to fuel you and give you the energy to do what you do without, say, early compensation or a big sign-on bonus or any of that. And I think that's the part of the life experience that's really, really critical if you're looking for a career to really do well and do good and have huge impact for people who are in low resource settings. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And in fact, your story is a wonderful segue now to the next espresso shot, which is what is the best part for you of being in this profession? And I want our listeners to know that I watched a presentation that you gave about ClickMedics and what you've done when you were in Taiwan. And there were a couple of points, Tang, that I thought you were about to cry. You were so overcome by emotion, talking about the people that you'd seen and the stories of their suffering and what they've had to endure to try to get help for their medical ailments. Clearly, you are fueled by tremendous passion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the best part is be able to see this idea you just had. And it was 10 years ago, we thought we could use mobile phones to deliver healthcare. So 10 years ago, that was before the smartphones. We had these Nokia phones that flipped up and then took really, really fuzzy pixelated pictures. But we thought well, that's better than nothing. And it is a way to communicate the conditions of patients to doctors anywhere. And when we actually tried it in Botswana with patients with cervical cancer and some actually also had HIV, AIDS, and it actually worked. And that was literally the most rewarding part that solidified 
that the fact that our concept actually could work. Little did I know all the other part of the journey that we had to go through to really make it a viable business, not just a concept or an idea. I think that that is the best part, seeing your idea come true. Mm. And I think another part that is really keeping me going is seeing that you're able to train someone else do the job of care delivery. And without you, you know, there's just no way they could do it. They could care for patients more easily. They literally, we call it one click, the one click model, one click interface. They tap on the button, now it's tap. But anyways, then they could get to the rest of the healthcare, all the medical experts that are available to help that patient. It's empowering for them and empowering for me as well. So you alluded <laughs> to the hard part of the job. What is the part? of your current job today as the CEO and co-founder of ClickMedics that sucks the most? Mm. Hmm. I would say, you know, <laughs> with any technology company, there's always the part of support where customers have issues and problems. And it's also one of the most important parts that you have to address and be the best you are at that. Customers, which are for us our health organization that have entrusted us to use our technology to literally become their operating system to empower their workers to deliver the care, to capture the necessary information for care to be delivered by remote physicians or the organization overall. You know, we're always there for them if there's any support need, but that literally keeps me up at night. And we run our team across all time zones, so three teams. And certainly there's a lot of, I'd say, work around the clock to make sure we're giving the best experience to our customers and then therefore their end patients. So I'd say that's physically challenging. And I think as an entrepreneur, I never thought my ability to stay up all night was so important. I'd say, you know, even during my computer science degree at Carnegie Mellon, I only slept four hours a day. I think I'm continuing that to like six hours a day. So I'd certainly say that's physically exhausting. And that's Other not good for your health, my friend. <laughs> oh my God. And you know, there is a special gene for those who really need less than eight hours of sleep. I think I have that gene. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then you're really lucky. I don't have that really? gene and I wish I did. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's. It's uh, years of training as well for not sleeping and just getting the, getting the work done. And, and I think I mentioned the fuel, right? <laughs> just staying up and you, you really do need to take a step back and think about why am I doing this? Am I getting rewarded for my effort in whichever way? And this, am I really going to get to billions? So, you know, that's certainly one part that I think every entrepreneur thinks about from time to time. Why am I doing this? I could get a corporate job and be very comfortable, but my fluctuations in terms of income is much greater, way bigger rewards, way more freedom, and I'd say I'm much happier. Oh, how amazing. I am so glad to hear that. So three final espresso shots, Tim. What mm -hmm. is the best career advice you've ever got? Hmm. There are so many, therefore it's kind of hard to pinpoint. I'd say the best one is really to do what makes you happy. I mean, my entire life motto is never regret what I do and just be happy. And I think that's driven a lot of what I do career-wise or didn't do career-wise. <laughs> I mean, before, after graduating from undergrad, I pursued so many careers. As you listed earlier, I was really a career ADD. Didn't know what I wanted. Finally, I got into healthcare and thought, I love that mission. I love that. And I'm just so passionate about it that I want to change my entire career from technology into business because I want to pursue that passion. And, and when I actually started working happy, I'm so freaking tired, but so happy. <laughs> so, yeah, so. but you didn't leave healthcare. You just went deeper into it. Right, right. So what I was doing in a healthcare company was um, business continuity planning, which is literally data centers, packing up data, make sure all the IT systems can come back alive if there's a disaster. So it's quite far <laughs> from working directly with patients. But the whole mission in, in terms of what 
great technology could do in healthcare, accelerating patients getting better, lowering costs, all of that is just amazing to me and and I'm proud to be doing a part of that. Well, it's amazing to me too. Ting, what movies, if any, or Netflix, Amazon, Hulu streaming (laughs) shows or books do you think accurately depict your profession? And it's fine to say there aren't any, but I have to ask you. I say if any of you have ever watched Silicon Valley, it's a TV show that depicts entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. That depicts my life pretty well too <laughs> as we started our journey. I think at one point, I don't want to be a spoiler alert, but their very important technology fell off a truck. <laughs> Something like that happened to me very, very early in wow. the journey before before I clicked medics. So yeah, it gets as bad as though sometimes worse, <laughs> but it's very amusing in hindsight because I've now gone through a lot of that. But pretty accurate, I'd say, if you are doing, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, that's a good show to watch. I'd say many come out very successful. Many also don't come out very successfully. So highly recommend it. Highly entertaining. So. That's yeah, I actually one. started laughing when you said Silicon Valley because the first thing that popped into my head, I don't know if you saw the episode and I'm forgetting all the characters' names, but the guy with the beard, right, whose house they're yeah. all living in, when yes. he commissions a kind of a, a street artist to uh-huh. create their logo yeah, uh, yeah, and some street art and the guy, <laughs> the guy creates. <laughs> Some kind of like phallic image on the oh, door yeah, of the their high Piper symbol. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think he's on a motorcycle or something, but that's uh, what yeah. popped into my head. I don't know why when you said it. So I'm glad to hear that part <laughs> is not something that you experienced. So okay, final uh, espresso yeah. shot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm glad. And and I'm also guessing that you wouldn't have like that's not where your brain would have taken you in terms of like <laughs> putting your limited resources. Final espresso yeah. shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about healthcare technology? Hmm, that's a very interesting one. I'm not sure if it's a surprise, but it's a very, very crowded space. And depend if we look at it globally in the U.S. is a very crowded space. If you look at globally, it's kind of crowded and still not as well utilized. I think what's surprising is still the challenge we're getting is still that adoption. How do you get patients to use a device or smartphone or be familiar with, say, a teleconsult with doctors? I say this pandemic has accelerated this adoption. Tr- dramatically mm. because it's just what we have to do. This type of adoption would have taken another 10 years if it weren't for the pandemic. The only silver lining I'm seeing, well, one of them. And and I think even for nurses or um, healthcare systems, you know, something that saves them a ton of money, helps the patient, improves their people's productivity, still takes a long time to go through the sales cycle to get them to adopt and to train all of their people. I mean, where it is obvious the solution makes sense, getting through the entire cycle of getting your clients to actually onboard does take a long time. That's certainly in a business to business sales. In a business to consumer, there are certainly different challenges. I think what's what's surprising and I think as early entrepreneur is that you may think your solution is the best in the world. It literally is your baby. Other people may not think that and the time to help them see your view or really understand the benefit could take way longer than you think. And I think part of the, lo- the learning journey is how do you make that a much more faster conversion? For us, it's taken us 10 years to get to a five-day deployment cycle basically helping customers understand what we do, see it in action on day two, train people on day three, and then roll it out. That's our typical cycle for our rapid deployment. And I think that's one of the things that took me like five years of being shocked by how come 
they don't understand this to learn, okay, how do I navigate around it? And how do I speed that up? So, so I think that's, I mean, there's so many surprises along the way, but I think that's one that really contributed to helping the business grow and certainly generate more impact. Fantastic. If you want to learn more about what Ting does at ClickMedics and how she's built ClickMedics and her incredible career, please check out show notes for this episode to see if her main Time for Coffee interview has already dropped. Ting, I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for making time for coffee in the middle of what I know are crazy work days with me and the Time for Coffee community. This was just wonderful. Thank you. I'm honored to be sharing the story and I appreciate the work that you do and the impact that you're also creating for our next generation. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.